comes, I'm a junior. I'm from Muncie, and I have a history major in English minor. Hi, I'm Jane Nervy, and I'm a freshman psychology major and a French minor, and I'm from Fort Wayne. I'm Jenny Curran, and I'm also from Muncie. I'm a political science major, and I'm going to law school in August. Okay. My name is Lee Tillits. I'm a junior legal administration major, and I'm from a What's a legal school. administration major? Mm. <laughs> 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 I've heard so many definitions in track. Basically, they work under assistance of a lawyer, rendering, I just had a test on this, okay. rendering <laughs> law services, not mm -hmm. regarding unauthorized practice of law. Yeah. My name is Amy Burke, and I'm a junior political science and history major. Happy to meet you. I understand what we're going to do here. You're going to ask questions, and I'm going to try to respond, right? <laughs> and, uh, um, if I may go first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think of the Arias Peace Plan, and do you think Congress should go ahead and rotate to the Contras? I think that, you know, I think the Arias Peace Plan is uh, mo the most interesting of all the various plans for peace that have been offered in Central America, actually. I think it's, you know, was more promising than the San Jose or than the Contador understandings or than the Manzanilla proposals that the U.S. made. I, I, so I think, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting. I, it was a plan, however, not simply a, uh, a set of good intentions. And it, well, the reason I think it was the most interesting is that it provided not only, uh, provi it really linked demilitarization in Central America to democratization in the region in a very specific way, and it provided some indicators for what democracy was. It didn't just leave sort of uh, that in the air either. It said, uh, you know, that it required uh, free expression and uh, free assembly and uh, restoration of uh, sort of the normal uh, state of law, normal rule of law throughout the region and ceasefire and general amnesty. And so it was really quite specific. And it also provided a definite time frame and uh, mechanisms for the me further meeting of the Central American presidents. I have, uh, I have felt very strongly since the Area's peace plan was proposed that the best role for the United States was to uh, stand aside, keep a low profile, leave, it, leave the Central American presidents to work out uh, these problems. And uh, <laughs> partly because almost anything we did, we would be likely to be blamed for in case the peace plan failed. Um, and while I have thought it was a, the most promising plan, I have thought also that the odds were against it. I have hoped for the best, but actually rather expected that it uh, might fail, in fact. The reason I have expected that it might fail is that there are some very intransigent people in the region, who, uh, some of whom are in Nicaragua, some of whom are in El Salvador, some in Guatemala, who, you know, who finally uh, are not ready to forego trying to settle the uh, uh, all of these questions by force. Um, therefore, I was not too surprised when it turned out that the, you know, that, uh, that the Central American presidents concluded at their last meeting on the 15th of January that there had not been adequate compliance for it. Um, the, and I, I feel today that the United States really should do, um, on the one hand, we should do nothing that, that uh, might diminish the possibilities of success. On the other hand, we need to be realistic about what it is that might diminish the possibilities of success. Thinking about it, you have to remember that the Sandinistas promised free expression and free assembly in rule of law in Nicaragua in June 1979, before they ever came to power. And um, they were very clear about these promises. These, were, these are promises in writing to the OAS. And um, they have not kept those promises, of course. So 
we have to understand that they they've done quite the opposite, um, and that that what the, the what the they may not keep these promises either. They made a new set of promises in Iskipoulos last August, and they may not keep those. Um, I think that that right now, what if, if what I would do if I were in Congress is vote for the president's proposal for the aid package, uh, which puts uh, what, nine tenths of the aid in non-lethal aid and one tenth of it in escrow until there is still a further opportunity to try to determine whether the Nicaraguan government is going to keep its latest set of promises. I think that's a sensible um, approach. And uh, because it, it provides enough support for the Contras that they would not be dismantled. And so it keeps the pressure on the Sandinistas to fulfill their promises. I wrote in my own column last week that I think we ought to, uh, since, since they have such a hard time keeping their promises, that we really need, the Congress needs to help them understand that democracy is their only alternative. And I think that the presence of the Contras and um, continuing U.S. interest uh, helps them perhaps perceive that democracy is finally their only alternative. And I think that's terribly important, not only for Nicaragua, but also for the region, I, because I don't think that there will be peace in El Salvador until there's democracy in Nicaragua, quite frankly. That, uh, it seems like everywhere you turn now, the NBC News is going to China, or the Today Show's in China, and even Spielberg's new movie is set in China. I just wonder, do you think that's a, just a popular culture trend? Do you think that's some sort of political set? Well, China is a very exciting place, you know. I mean, it's <laughs> the biggest country in the world. It's the most populous country in the world. It's, I mean, think about all the, all the people in China. That's, uh, it's, it's one of the oldest and most highly developed uh, human civilizations. And I think it's perfect. And for a long time, it was relatively closed to Americans and uh, Westerners, but that whole period of the Cultural Revolution especially and uh, to a slightly lesser degree since the Chinese Communists came to power in China. And um, I think it's natural that there would be a lot of interest in China. I feel a lot of interest in China, and everybody I know feels very interested in, in China and wants to visit and wants to uh, you know, travel in China and to get acquainted with Chinese. and. Um, we, I think we all wish them well, very much, too. I, there's, a, there's an interesting change process underway. I believe that the reforms in China, the efforts at economic reform in China of the, this very highly centralized bureaucratized system are uh, more sweeping, and they've been uh, developed further, certainly, than reforms in the Soviet Union so far, about which we are also very interested in that. Mm -hmm. I went to China, let me just say. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I would go back given the chance here. Four of us at this table went to China this summer. Did you? That's mm -hmm. probably where John's question came from. <laughs> How long were you there? Two and a half weeks. Right. And okay. two weeks in South Korea. Yeah. Well, I was there three weeks, so we, we had about a similar <laughs> visit. Here. Right. And, uh, with the new situation in Israel, mm -hmm. what uh, do you foresee any actions by the United Nations as far as to try to bring a settlement to this, maybe a, a peacekeeping force on the West Bank or anything? They can't do that. Uh, they, uh, no. I just, it just so happens that I just talked to the Israel's ambassador to the United Nations uh, just before I came down here, as a matter of fact and also the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. So my, my information on this is pretty current. Um, the, um, I mean, just before I came down to this meeting, not, not just before I came to Muncie. Um, there, you know, the U.N. Security Council is meeting today, which is why I was talking to them. And uh, there's no doubt there may be an effort to send U.N. observers to the West Bank and Gaza, but Israel will not accept such observers. And um, I think the United States will support Israel in that. Um, the, you know why? Let me tell you why. The, the reason is that there are no UN observers in Afghanistan. There are no UN observers in Tibet. 
we're speaking of China. Uh, there are no UN observers in Ethiopia, in, uh, except in very restricted areas where there is food, you know, being delivered with the very much the permission and organization of the Ethiopian government. Uh, there are no UN observers in North Ireland. Um, there are no UN observers in, where, in Punjab. Um, there are no UN observers, in short in most of the, you know, the troubled areas of the world because uh, sovereign nations do not uh, welcome uh, such intervention. And generally speaking, where there are UN observers only where there is permission of the uh, country involved, and usually at the request of the country involved. There are some UN observers, uh, for example, in uh, southern Lebanon, but that's with the permission of, and at a certain point, with the request of the government of Lebanon. There are some UN observers in Gaza, and a restricted mission, and that too is with the full cooperation of the government of Israel, but I don't expect any further observer teams. I am told it will not happen. Uh, interesting question is what the U.S. is going to do confronted with uh, this, and my, answer, my guess is not much. Because in a general kind of way, the United States does not acquiesce in um, what might simply be called the scapegoating of Israel in the United Nations, which is a, a, a very uh, well-established uh, process in the UN. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it true that um with the third world nations, with some of them defaulting on their debts, like to the United States, could that cause a recession in the United States, do you think? Almost anything could cause a recession, <laughs> it seems to me. <laughs> this is, uh, the, you know, uh, one of the things I'm going to talk some about tonight is the extent to which we really do today have a uh, global economy in the financial uh, sphere. Well, we, we really have a global fiscal economy. That, um, and that means that the situation is much more volatile than it has ever been, and that uh, major developments, almost any place, can have major, you know, very big economic impact. I was thinking this morning, in thinking about this, uh, about the U.S. oil industry's depression, which is very great, and, and its impact is very large in oil-producing states. Um, probably has had some minor impact in Indiana, even. That, um, and I was thinking about the extent to which this is a, a function, I believe, of OPEC. And the exaggerated, you know, when OPEC action drove prices so high, and it created uh, very inflated uh, expectations of profit, of massive profits in the oil industry all over the world, including in the United States. So huge investments were made, and expansion was undertaken. A lot of wells which had not been profitable were um, reactivated. Um, uh, and now, you know, then, then the price began to fall as OPEC began to, uh, well, various things happened. One of the things that happened is that OPEC became less efficient. Another thing that happened was, of course, that conservation uh, took hold and, and actual uh, demand declined. But that left the, then the, our domestic oil industry uh, overextended and uh, with the over, overly optimistic uh, expectations. And so it produced a real, a deep depression and dislocation in a number of states, including places like Texas and Oklahoma and New Mexico and so forth. Um, well, you know, it's, that's one example of the way this interdependence works. Certainly the debt, in case of the development of a debt cartel in Latin America and some sort of common action to renounce debt, uh, I think there could be, uh, you know, dramatic economic impact, not only on the United States but also on London and uh, certain, maybe Germany, German banks, um, 
and uh, certainly it could contribute mightily to a recession. I don't think our press probably damages our image. I don't know. Uh, I don't think most countries, the countries that don't have a free press themselves, are not going to be overly impressed with our free press. So we're not going to get many gold stars, you know, in their eyes just for having a free press. But of course, we don't have it for them. We have it for us. That's, uh, and we ought to be very clear about that. Pro you know, it, it may very well be that uh, that we could conduct foreign policy more effectively if we had a fully controlled press. Uh, so I used to, you know, think that sometimes at the UN when my opponents would come in and read from Time magazine or, <laughs> you know, Newsweek for that week or something, slashing attacks on the United States and say, this is what Americans think about what you're doing. Um, but obviously that's, you know, not a price we want to pay. Uh, yeah. well, speaking of press, mm -hmm. this is an appointed question, so you don't mm -hmm. have to answer it if you don't choose. Mm -hmm. But what do you think of the favorable presentations the press gave about Gorbachev, and especially Times Magazine mm. making him Man of the Year? You know, I mean, the, Gorbachev is very charming. And he's a very impressive man, let me just say. I don't know anybody who meets Gorbachev and doesn't find him impressive. That's, um, you said you met last year with Henry Kissinger here. And, uh, Henry Kissinger and I were in Moscow together, and we met Gorbachev together, and we both also saw him during his visit here. We met him first in Moscow and uh, then in Washington. We were as impressed by him as I think most other people are in terms of his, the fact that he's an, an, you know, a vigorous, energetic, uh, persuasive, uh, you know, attractive kind of person. Um, and that's such a shock for a Soviet leader. <laughs> I mean, you know, by the sort of, he walks, he talks, uh, and, you know, and he, uh, he doesn't, you know, but, but look at the, the Soviets. I mean, he's nothing like Brezhnev or, you know, Chernyenko, both of whom uh, were, uh, seemed barely alive. Um, <laughs> he travels, and he seems like a modern man. The real point about Gorbachev is that he seems like a modern man. And he's greatly impressed the press. Sometimes I think the American press is, uh, a little, you know, a little overawed by him just because he acts like a British leader or a French leader or an American leader or something, and he has those character, you know, sort of open kind of breezy style, um, and they give him a kind of free ride that they wouldn't dream of giving an American public figure of any of any party, let me say, or persuasion. And I don't think they ought to do that. I don't think they ought to be naive, quite frankly. And I think sometimes they were. I thought. You know, uh, Tom Brokaw's interview, if you watched it, uh, was characterized, I think, above all, by a failure to follow up on a lot of Gorbachev's answers. If he'd been an American being interviewed, he would have gotten follow-up questions to about half of his answers, and Brokaw didn't. I think that's too bad, but, uh, you know, they'll get used to him. Going back to the United Nations. Pardon me? So going back to the United mm -hmm. Nations, if you look at the challenges that American, America has faced in the United Nations and the, basically the opposition that they have faced towards mm -hmm. policies that we try to implement, what kind of chances do American delegations going to the United Nations have in making positive changes for democracy throughout the world? If they've been faced well, uh, the everybody understand that question? Yeah. Uh, I don't think American delegations have much chance going to the United Nations as an arena in which to try to improve democracy in the world, because that's not the kind of place the UN is. Think about it, you know, I mean, two-thirds of the members of the UN are non-democracies. Well, I didn't uh, mean it as far as promoting yeah. our own mm -hmm. beliefs and feelings. No. But my question is, is what we have had such negative reactions mm -hmm. to everything that we've voted mm -hmm. on, we've been voted against, mm -hmm. like you said, slammed mm -hmm. all over the press. And mm -hmm. Do we have a chance of salvating salvaging our image? Oh, sure, at the UN. Yes, I'm afraid so. I think we do. Um, I'm, I'm not afraid that I think we do. I mean, I think we do. <laughs> and I'm afraid that the way we have to do it, though, is, uh, you know, is old-style politics. Mm -hmm. the, I think the U.S. can, in fact, affect our own treatment inside the UN. As a matter of fact, I don't really think it, if I may say so, I demonstrated it as... Uh, 
I say in all modesty, we did in fact improve the treatment of the United States inside the United Nations. And there is, the United, the United States today is not continually denounced in resolution after resolution. Uh, we call it name calling. <laughs> this is, uh, we were the only country in the world um, except Israel and South Africa and maybe El Salvador who were denounced in UN resolutions. Um, and we're not anymore. And that, uh, you know, we did that by old-fashioned politics. Actually, the politics of the UN is a lot like the politics of the Indiana State Legislature at the turn of the century. Uh, I probably, I don't know the Indiana State Legislature that well, but um, uh, it's a lot like a lot of American state legislatures at the turn of the century, and uh, we have since outlawed some of the practices of politics, but it's a hardball, rough game of politics in which um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of hardball politics played all the time in the UN. And the United States has historically not played that. We haven't played any kind of politics, much less hardball politics in the UN. We really have, um, have behaved as though we didn't know what was, uh, understand what was going on around us, really. Have uh, we been submissive on the whole? Pardon me? Have we been submissive on the whole? Uh, yeah, but I would say rather we've been, we behaved as though we didn't really understand what was the game that was being played in the UN, uh, which is, you know, played through the blocks, like, which is the function like a lot like political parties. And, um, well, once we begin using the kinds of influence that are available to us, then we can improve our situation in the UN, and we did. And if we continue, you know, we we can continue to improve our situation. I think that um, the biggest problem, by the way, the biggest victims of the way the UN works are not us, because we're strong enough that we can slough it off, basically, um, or even Israel, which is also a strong country, but. It's Countries like Chad, for example, who's miserable, poor, you know, a third world country, that, let's say, invaded by Gaddafi and confronted with Libyan tanks, comes to the UN for help. Now, if the, what the UN is supposed to do is, is, you know, help protect countries against aggression. So when Libya committed aggression against Chad, Lib Ch Chadian foreign minister came to the UN for help. He was a very um, sort of moving figure. He was a very tall, rather young man who always wore very long, flowing, light blue robes. And he would walk around the halls of the UN looking for help. And he expected that the Security Council was going to help Chad deal with aggression in Libya. Uh, forget it, you know. There was no chance that the Security Council was going to help because Libya is very wired into the bloc system in the UN. Libya is a member of the Arab bloc and the Islamic Conference and the Africa bloc and the very close to the Soviet bloc. Now Chad was a member of the African bloc, but that was all. And they didn't, they didn't have a chance. The, the, if you've got blocks which support you, that constitute you know, anything close to a majority, you're never going to be touched. But there's never been an African nation that's been the object of a, of a UN uh, condemnation, human rights actions. You know, take somebody like Idi Amin, for example, the point that he was murdering about 10,000 a week uh, never was the object of a UN action. The uh, Qaddafi, who's about as dismal a citizen of his area as you could get, he tried <laughs> assassination plots and coup d'etats and invasions of almost all of his neighbors, in fact, from time, one time or another, never been the object of a UN operation. No African state, no Arab state has ever been the object of a UN resolution of any kind. And the saddest thing are the, the, the people who need them the most, like Chad, can't get the help there. That, mm. so what, do you do, what do you suggest 
should be done to where the ones that need the help get it instead of the ones that don't. Well, fortunately, the French came to the help of the Chadians. And that's fortunate because there was no way there were any UN help. Um, I don't think that there is any way that the U.S. could do anything today that would fundamentally change the block system. We can <laughs> learn to protect ourselves a little better in the block system, but I don't think we can alter that system. And that's another way of saying that the U.N. is simply not going to be able to take effective action in uh, promotion of peace or conflict resolution in almost any kind of, in almost any cases and that's why to go back to your first question that's why you know it is not reasonable to uh, ask Israel as sort of the only country in the world to become the object of uh, UN action when uh, the UN does not act against all the other conflicts it's also why they're not able to uh, act on the Iran-Iraq war, let's say. Talking about third world countries, how, uh, how should the U.S. Um, deal with them? How, how can we help them? Deal with whom? Third world countries. Oh, well, I think they differ a lot among, you know, I mean, they're just a colossally different. And I think one really has, we really, if we're going to have realistic policies, economic or any other kind of policies, development aid policies, we have to tailor our policies to the country and the region. So I think you have to break that down. Yeah. Yeah. What do you see as the main benefits coming from the UN, though? Everything we've heard so far as far as peacekeeping and, and a lot of politics has been negative. But uh, maybe from some of the social programs, do you feel like they're affected? Well, they're, uh, Pete, they're, they're, yeah, the reason. That the reason we've heard that is because that's what we've been talking about, isn't right, it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think <laughs> there, um, you know, and the, and the central purpose of the UN, according to the Charter, is of course to promote the peaceful resolution of conflict. That, uh, and that's what it can't do. Now, I think there are some things that the UN can do, and uh, the most constructive things that the UN does, it does through the specialized agencies like the World Health Organization and um, the High Commissioner on Refugees that provides subsistence food and clothing for about 14 million refugees. Uh, and the World Health Organization has actually succeeded in eliminating a lot of the, the sort of age-old scourges of mankind, like tuberculosis, for example, in the world, um, and diphtheria and a lot of other such diseases. Uh, UNICEF is, uh, I think, quite effective in lowering infant mortality and promoting childhood nutrition and so forth. Uh, the, the, there's some scientific agencies like the, uh, well, the World Meteorological Organization, which does a lot of very useful collection of information and data on weather, um, that sort of thing. It's the humanitarian and the technical specialized agencies that do the most constructive work. Um, some of those, by the way, existed before the UN came into being. And they are largely insulated from the politics of the General Assembly and the Security Council and the block system. Insofar as the, those politics of the UN uh, uh, General Assembly get extended into the specialized agencies, they become less effective. There was a great threat of politicization of the World Health Organization a few years ago. And there was a very heavy level of politicization of the ILO, the International Labor Organization, and uh, at the insistence of the American uh, labor movement, the AFL-CIO, the U.S. and various others walked out as we walked out of UNESCO because it was hopelessly politicized. Um, now, once we walked out, they undertook some reforms in the ILO and we went back and we may do that in UNESCO. But this is, uh, it is above all these agencies which make the major contribution on behalf of the UN. Are these enough to keep yeah. the United Nations alive and, and uh, vibrant? Well, the fact, it, you know, it isn't very vibrant. There's no point in kidding ourselves, you know. This is, it is alive, however, and in my view, it will, it doesn't, you know, doesn't require any special effort on our part. It, it'll, it'll live. <laughs> this is, it's, uh, it's not vibrant, but it's uh, vigorous enough to survive. I don't have any doubt about that. It's there.
It's not, it's not doubt, you know. We're about at, at that time. Uh, if we have maybe one more question, we'll probably feel one more, but uh, uh, if it would be all right with you, uh, if these students come around behind and we kind of group together, could we get one shot of, of all sure. the students?